drunk with the blood of Yah's people. She hung Yah's people on trees and impaled them on torture stakes. She even took Yahshua HaMashiach, and according to Acts 5.30, Acts 10, 29, 13, 29, Galatians 2, 24, that she hung Yahshua on a tree. Who did she hang here in America from sea to shining sea but you on a tree? Mm. Same thing. Mm. Pay attention. Mm. Wake up and see See if it was exactly it is, beloved. You gotta keep these feast days. These are agricultural feast days. There are more deems in their appointed seasons. And they put you, this is the key. They put you, when you do them, you come off of the Gentile time clock and you get on Yah's right timing position. Yeah. When I left the Avo Dive today, that each and every one of us in Israel have affectionately coined the plantation. Yes, we all on plantations here. You're on Plantation Walmart, Plantation Target. You're on Plantation Downtown in the high-rise building, Plantation Google, Plantation U.S. Army. Wherever you're at, you're on the plantation because you don't own and control none of the places that you at. You're punching the clock for somebody else. When I walked out the door, I looked in the Western Hemisphere, and the second day in a row, he allowed me to see the moon, and I saw the sliver of light, and I said, thank you, y'all, for putting me back on your timepiece. Hey. If you celebrated January the 1st as New Year's, you are out of your mind. You are not on y'all's timepiece. If you kept ho, ho, hoax, you are not on y'all's timepiece. I'm going back to the future. If you kept thanks taken, it's a lie. You are not on y'all's timepiece. If you kept the misogynist, twisted day of Columbus, you are off time of y'all. Ooh, and if dang. you turn around and keep oh. coming Sunday with somebody Valentine's gift, you are a pagan practicing Hebrew. Get thee behind me, Satan. Come on, come on. You don't give nobody no candies and no trinkets and no flowers and no roses and no gifts with a heart shot from a doggone pagan god you call Cupid. Hmm. That's got nothing to do with you. Dang. Genesis 10 and 5, the scripture tells you who that came from, the isles of the Gentiles. Jeremiah 10, 5 says, learn not the ways of the Gentiles. Mm. Hey. Well, I mean, I mean, he loves me, don't he? If he set aside one day out of 364 to let you know he loves you, he don't love you at all. Come on. If you wait for one day out of 364 days for her to tell you I love you, she don't love you at all. But the scripture yeah. tells you that love endures all. It deals with all. It suffers all. It's long-suffering. It's kind. It's gentle. That type of love, you don't get one day out of a year. You need that. I need that every day, 364 days out of a year. That's the kind of love I'm talking about in Israel. You don't fall in love like the heathen. Reverse the curse. You rise in love. See the difference? You don't tell her that she's beautiful. You tell her she's beautiful. Oh. you got to change it. you got the power to define. You take it back and make the power to define. When I say Judith or dutiful, I'm telling you the sister is dutiful. She's full of Judah. She's beautiful that she's from Judah. She's beautiful that she's from Israel. She is beautiful that she's from Gad, Manasseh, Asher, Levi. She's beautiful. She's dutiful. We're giving you different words today in Israel so you can reverse the curse. It's not just awesome. It's Yasum. That's what it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are teaching an awesome Yahshua teaching here. We are Yahwistic. We teach Yah. We teach Yahshua crucified on the third day he rose again. That's what we teach Hallelujah. here. Hallelujah. We teach Hallelujah. the whole book, Hallelujah. the book, and nothing but the book. Coming in the full volume of Yah. Not just bits and pieces and some of y'all doing what I call the agriculturalist. Cherry-picking thing. <laughs> Come on. 
cherry picking the word, grape picking the word. I'm going to pick and choose what I want on the scriptures here. I'm going to deceive the sister here. I'm going to tell the brother, stop that foolishness. Mm. Stop it. Mama. Isaiah 8 and 20 says, to the law and the testimony. If they don't come in the, four, the five books, and they don't come in all the prophets, and they don't come in the bazaar, they do that because there is no light in them. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 8 and 20 says, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. You need to ask for the discernment of spirit. Mm-hmm. Brother teaching you different things, and it's not in the scriptures. You need to cut that relationship off. Where did you get that from? You got it from the prince. You got it from the word. Your own soul and spirit tell you when something ain't right. You get an uneasy, sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Your shoulders get tight. That's your sign from heaven that that spirit ain't right and it's foul. It's the discernment of the spirit that's telling you. You need to recognize that you're being led by the spirit. You turn on the program and you see somebody all frowns up and angry, talking down to you, not raising you up. They have not been sent to you from Yah. That's from the enemy. Come on, Archie. The spirit of Yah would not beat you down, Israel. It would lift you up. What would be the purpose of beating the people who have been raped, pillaged, robbed, exploited, sodomized, put in captivity? How much further down can you beat us when we're below the ground itself? Hallelujah. Come on. You got to turn it around and lift you up and raise up the name of Yah. He wants you to make right angles to the earth. That's what hey. he wants you to do. You can only do that by keeping his word, his commandments, his precepts, and his judgments. Do you understand what I'm saying? Verse 17. Y'all have got me yeah. excited. Hallelujah. 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 Verse 17 says, And you shall bring from your dwellings two wave offerings of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahweh. You shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull, two rams. They shall be as the burnt offering of Yahweh with their grain offerings, their drink offerings, Offerings made by fire for a sweet aroma unto Yahweh. That you shall sacrifice one of the kids of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of the peace offering. The priest shall wave them, wave, wave offering, wave them with the bread of the first fruit as a wave offering before Yahweh with the two lambs. They shall be holy for the priest unto Yahweh. You shall proclaim on the same day that there is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. Your regular work ceases and desists. Continuing. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statue forever throughout all your generations. You shall, you shall, Israel, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. When you reap, nor shall you gather any gleanings from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger, for I am Yahweh. Now, you all know we read that when we went over the scriptures last week about the same uh, subject matter that we had talked about, pretending to leave me something in your land, on your field, for the poor, for the widower, and the stranger. Remember, to treat the stranger right among you, for we were strangers while we were in Egypt. Continuing, it says, This is verse 23. Very important because now we're going into another feast day. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Benai Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Shabbat of rest, a memorial blowing of the trumpets. Like when we started the class, you heard the shofar blow. So at the beginning of every month, when the new moon comes, we blow the shofar. So let's pause here. Take your scriptures, turn to the book of Tehillim, which is the book of Psalms. You're turning to the book of Psalms, and you're going to Psalms chapter 81. Psalms chapter 81. In Psalms 81, in verse 3 says, Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon. So every new moon, 
every new month, like we did last night, like we did tonight when we assembled, because the night was, the evening part was going out into the Lila, so it's going from day one to day two. So we're going from Erev to Lila, Arab to Lila. So as the day is changing, at the close of that day, the shofar is sounded. We're in our 12th month. Next month, the second month, third month, all the way to the 12th month next year, we're in a cycle, remember? The new moon is a cog. It is a, it is a cog. It's, it's, a, it, it's an observance. We know that we blow the shofar on the new moon. Verse 3 says, blow the shofar, the trumpet, at the time of the new moon. Watch now. At the full moon, which is your 14th day, on all your solemn feast days. Why? For this is a statue for Israel and a law of the mighty one of Jacob. This he established in Yosef as a testimony. So we keep it. That's why we keep it, because it's scriptorial. And we're supposed to do it. You announce your months. You, know? you announce your high holy days. You proclaim them. It is called a hoda'ah, a proclamation. You proclaim it, because the Most High told us to. Back to Leviticus 23, the seventh month is Tishri, known when we were in Babylon, we called it Ethanim. Tishri is the seventh month. On the first day of the seventh month, you blow your shofar, you have a Shabbat of rest, a memorial blowing of the trumpets. We do not call this Rosh Hashanah. This is not the beginning of the year. This is the seventh month. This is, again, is a clear indication to you that there are imposters impersonating you. Nowhere in our book does it tell us to observe the seventh month as the new year. Your seventh month and the observance of the first day of the seventh month is the memorial blowing of the trumpets. In your language, it is called Shabbaton Zikron. Shabbaton, the memorial blowing of the trumpets. It is also called Yom Teruah. We don't ever call it Rosh Hashanah because it is not the head of our year. The head of our year is next month, not seven months from then. It says you must keep a holy convocation. Do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Verse 26. Yahweh said unto Moses, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. It is a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. You shall not do any work on the same day. For it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahweh. For any person who is not afflicted in his soul, on that same day that person shall be cut off. And King David said in Psalms 35, when we read two weeks ago and last week, I afflicted my soul with what? Fasting. So you take your hand, you cover your mouth. The Hebrew word for that is sum. If you cover your hand with your mouth, nothing goes in and nothing comes out. You're fasting. So during Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippur, you fast. It is the day of atonement. Any person who is not afflicted in his soul on the same day shall be cut off from among his people. And any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It is a statue forever throughout all your generations and all your dwellings. It so shall be unto you a Shabbat of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day at evening of the month to the evening of the tenth day. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Shabbat. This is a double Shabbat. All right? Verse 33. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, and the fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of the tabernacles. Kog Sukkot. Kog Sukkot. The feast of the tabernacles. All right? That's Kog Suko. So to everybody. Whoever that was, they muted themselves. So you're counting. You're still in the seventh month. So now we went through trumpets, first day of the seventh month, ninth day of the evening to the tenth day of the evening, Yom Kippurim in the seventh month. It's the third feast in this seventh month. Now what's real interesting about it is you have three feasts in the first month, right? 
Pesach, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Then you pause for a period of 50 days, and you got one feast. And that one feast is called Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. You don't, we don't have no other feast till we get to the seventh month. And when we get to the seventh month, here are the last remaining three feast days. The last remaining three feast days, again, are Yom Teruah, Shabbaton Zikron, that's one. Then Yom Kippur, that's two. And the one we're reading about right now is three, which is the Feast of the Tabernacles called Kod Sudko. It reads, <clears throat> Then Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Benai Israel in the fifteenth day of the seventh month that there shall be a Kod Shavuot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days unto Yahweh. On the first day, there should be a holy convocation. You should do no customary work on it. For seven days, you shall offer offering made by fire unto Yahweh. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It is a sacred assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of Yahweh, which you, Israel, shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, and a drink offering, everything on its day, besides the Shabbats of Yahweh, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, besides all your free will offerings, which you shall give unto Yahweh. Also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered the fruit of your land, so it tells you this is, a, this is a feast of harvest. When you have gathered all the fruit of your land, this is your what? Autumn feast. This is your autumn feast. When you have gathered all the fruit of your land, you shall keep the feast of Yahweh for seven days. On the first day, there should be a Shabbat of rest. And on the eighth day, notice it didn't say the seventh. On the eighth day, there should be a Shabbat of rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, balls of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh, your mighty one, for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in all your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Why? You shall dwell in booze for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booze. Sukkahs. We came out of Egypt. One of the first places we went to was Sukkot. Place right outside the southern part of Egypt on the east of Kemet. First place we went. We went to a place that means dwelling in tents or booths. When we were wandering for 40 years, what do we think we lived in? Booths or sukkahs. We lived in tents. That's what we lived in. So it is to remind us of what the Most High did for us and made provisions for us. It is a holy convocation. Everybody that's on this line, unless you tell me differently, you are a native-born Israelite. It says, all who are native-born Israelites shall dwell in booths. So every year in the seventh month, we assemble for booths. And we've been doing it for time and memorial. In fact, my sons are so in love with this feast. And I bear, if there was someone in here right now to have me bear record, you will find a tent right now, a sukkah in my buy-in up right now that's been up since the Feast of the Tabernacles because the boys will not take it down. You know, some folks like to leave the Christmas tree up. Past so-called December, past January, into February, does it turn into brittle? You leave that thing on with the lights on it, catch on fire. Has nothing to do with the Creator, but because they were raised in this, and because we would always go out in the seventh month and dwell in tents, and we liked the hiking part and everything associated with it. They said, "Abba, you might as well leave that up because we're gonna be leaving out of here in tents anyway." These are children that said that. So. We're going to encourage you who don't have it. Go, as I've seen some of you all making your adjustments, go and get you a tent. Yes, go and get you a tent to dwell in. Not just for God's sukkah that's coming up, but you need a tent to dwell in if you're going to have to flee and get up out of here. When this economy is broken, you can't live in them apartments that you're living in paying the rent that you can't already afford, living from paycheck to paycheck. Borrowing money 
from the pay cash station and check loans and quick loans? You know I'm telling you the truth. I ain't got to name no name, but we all in Israel are suffering in the same condition. This economy is bankrupt. They're holding it together with a Band-Aid, a Kirad. It's bleeding profusely. It fell again another 270-some points. Dang. Dang. You need to be watching what's going on. I told you weeks ago, so does Asia go, so does the U.S. economy go. Nathaniel been telling you they done bought the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chinese have, for $22 trillion. You think they bought it because they like it? No, they bought it because they're getting ready to leverage against it. Dang. You better be preparing See, a wise man or woman see destruction coming, and they prepare for it. That's what wisdom, people of wisdom do. They prepare for that which is coming. Hey. We read all this here in the scripture. We close here in the 23rd chapter as we get ready to go into 24, 25, 26, and 27. All right? It says that your generations may know. That means your children, Toledo. Your offspring after you need to know this, what? That I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your mighty one. So Moses declared unto the children of Israel that these were the feasts of Yahweh. That is the reading of Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1 through 44. May Yahweh add clarity, clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. Hallelujah. All right. Anybody get any questions on the feast days? How you supposed, or when you supposed to keep them? How you supposed to keep them? What you supposed to do? Um, we'll y'all again. Um, my situation, I'm going to tell you why I stopped. Because I, um, up until now, uh, because I received so many different dates that I just got confused and I just, just put a stop to it. Uh, up until now, uh, but my question is, um, the way that, it's not really a question, but I guess I'll throw a question in there, the way that I see, I guess, the Jews celebrated, I, I knew within my heart that that's not, that's not us, with the, just, this is not us. Right. I pictured us, I pictured a family reunion. Absolutely. Um, barbecuing. Eating, celebrating, playing good music, dancing, enjoying ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, am I right about that? Let me say this to you, Let me, and I'm going to come back to that point. And don't let me forget to come back to the point. Let me say this to you because you're right on point. If we were to just stop for a minute, think about what our brother said. Let me read to you real quickly what's written out of the book of Jubilees in the sixth chapter. It says, Verse 32, and you shall command the children of Israel that they should guard the years in this number, 364 days, and it will be a complete year unto them. And no one shall corrupt its appointed fixed time, for it is the days or from its feast, because all of Yah's appointed times will arrive in them according to their testimony, and they will not pass over a day, and they will not corrupt the feast. Talking about us, if we did it this way. But if they are transgressors and they do not observe according to the commandments, then they will corrupt, watch now, all of their fixed times. Sabbath, some people float in the Shabbat, all the high holy days, and the years will move from one place to another in this order, and they will transgress the ordinances. And then all their sons and daughters will forget and they will not find the right way to the years. And they will forget the new moons. So how many of everybody that's on this line right now, outside of me sharing this with you all, outside of Yekaziel and uh, Jehoshaphat and Ariah and Saraya and Iman, Demiria and Zeruriah and others, not to put nobody on blast and Sister Gloria, knew that tonight was the second day going into our new moon. And because it's not being taught, people are getting on the street corners talking about stuff that, yes, it has a purpose to bring people into identity, but it does not serve any purpose beating a brother or sister down when they're walking down the street. 
calling them bad names. We should be teaching this law and bringing back people to the feast days. Zeruiah is right on point. He's right on point. It is not to be laborious. It is not to be labor. You're not supposed to stand into the assembly and somebody read and teach to you three, four, five, six, seven hours. You're tired. It's supposed to be a family assembly and a reunion of goodness and happiness. You're supposed to be happy, joyful. It is supposed to be celebratory when you get to these feast days. Y'all remember when y'all was keeping Christmas? Y'all been prepared for Christmas way back in August. Somebody hear me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Y'all better bear me record on this. The most high is listening to you. Hey. You know thanks taking coming. You went and you saved up money way back in September. <laughs> but when it comes to y'all's feast day, don't nobody have no money to come to the assembly to celebrate the feast days of y'all. Come on. Every reason on earth come up, my light bill is on, my gas bill is on, whatever bill. You got the same bill when you was in hell, keeping the days of the heathen, but you went into death for pagan days, but you won't come into light for Yah's days. You hear what I say? See? And we don't teach them like they're burdened. We assemble, we open up with the appropriate scripture for it, and just as the Ruriah says, we begin the singing and the dancing, and we do the celebration and the praise to the Most High. And it is a family gathering because you are all Mishpachah. We come together to celebrate Yah's feast day, to show him that you love him, praise him, and celebrate and shout for joy to him, so he'll bless you. But every other time and every other day, we do everything for every all the wrong reasons. If you want to go to the store to buy you some new pair of shoes, sister got a closet full of shoes. She ain't got no sandals for the holy day, but she got a closet full of shoes. Brother got more watches than you can go tick tock. Here come the clock, and he can't go and put nothing down for the feast day. Somebody talk back to me. You know I'm telling you the truth. Okay. Come on. These days they're burdened because some of our hearts ain't right. Man, when I first found out the truth, and Elder Shadow and I had told me 30 years ago, I ran to the store to get something for Yom Kippur, and he said, son, you're supposed to fast this day. That's how serious I was, and I didn't know I had to be taught. My heart was right. I was just doing something in the wrong way, and he stopped me. He said, after Yom Kippur, we'll celebrate and have a meal and partaking. And every time we come and assemble, when we have assembled, we do it with joy and gladness to lift up the praise of the Holy One of Israel. That's, brother, absolutely right. You're supposed to put your burnt offering out there. You put your lamb and your goat or whatever it is you're eating that's clean meat for those of you in Israel who eat meat. And some of us who are vegetarians and some of us who are vegan, we don't eat meat. But we come together and we all celebrate together in the same place. This is one Israelite community that does not make a judgmental decision on what it is you're eating, but you won't come up in there with no pork. You can't come with no lobster. You can't come with no catfish. But you can come with yeah. everything that's clean and make sure you come with some yayin for those brothers and sisters who want to celebrate to the most high. Mm -hmm. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Okay. Right on point. Leviticus chapter 24, as I told you all, this is going to be a lengthy one, and I know for those who are still on, who say, well, you usually do two and a half hours on Yom Kamashi Eve, so-called Thursday night, we're just going to run another 20 or 30 minutes or so, we would be on time, we just have to get these uh, chapters done, so now we're in 24, Leviticus, right? So I got a question. Tell everybody, who is this? Could you please announce who you are and greet us with a shalom? Shalom. My my, my uh, name is Brasi, and my question is that on the 25th of March, that we are supposed to celebrate Pass Passover in the evening. Yes. That evening. The evening of the 24th, going into the 25th. Okay. It, was that your question, beloved? That, that was my question. 
Okay. Toda. Hallelujah. Can you repeat that? Yeah. The assembly, you begin to observe the day. The 14th comes in at evening on the 24th going into the 25th. So when we assemble, we will be literally in the 24th between the twilight going into the 25th. So we'll be going through Passover into unleavened bread. So the 25th, then we'll be assembling the 26th, and then we'll be closing it out on the 27th. And then everybody will return to their respective bayits until another uh, seven-day period after the 15th. And then you reassemble those who will be with us. You reassemble on that day to close out the card. But then you would keep the rest of the days at your respective bayits, wherever you may be. So some are coming to celebrate it with us. Those who are coming that we've already invited, everybody that's online, you're, you're welcome to come. We are actually in the last, in, well, not the last, the second to the last stage of uh, all the details that will be forthcoming shortly for Pesach. So look for it to be sent to you in an email. Or we will announce it uh, within the next, probably either this Shabbat or the following Shabbat, the actual specific location. So as we go forward, Let's read into uh, the book of Leviticus in the 24th chapter. That's where we're going to go. All right, let's go into Leviticus 24. And it reads on this line. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for light, to light the lamps burning continuously. Outside of the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning, and it shall be before Yahweh continuously. It shall be a statue forever in all your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps of the pure gold and the lampstands before Yahweh continuously. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, two tenths of an ephah shall be each cake. So each one of these 12 cakes is for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You shall set them in two rows, six on one row, and pure gold is the making of the table. It shall be before Yahweh. You shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Every Shabbat he shall set them in order before Yahweh continuously, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his son, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy unto him from the offerings of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. It is a perpetual statute. Verse 10. Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian, hmm, quite interesting, went out amongst the children of Israel, and this Israelite, and this Israelite son, a woman's son, and the man of Israel fought each other in the camp. <clears throat> the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of Yahweh. Hmm. And cursed, <clears throat> so that they brought him to Moses, parentheses, his mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And then they put him in custody, that the mind of Yahweh might be shown unto them. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, take outside the camp him who cursed. Then let all who hear him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Whoever curses his mighty one, or his God, shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him with stones. <laughs> And the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of Yahweh, he shall surely be put to death. When he blasphemes the name of Yahweh, 
he should surely be put to death. Now, this for me is a very important section here in Israel. I mean, a very important uh, scripture to look at. Now, I just want to give you the word, because we're going to come back to this momentarily. He who blasphemes the name of Yahweh, Ne'ashta, Ne'ashta, some pronounces that. As it's the Hebrew letter, Nun, Aleph, Sadi, and He. Right? And this word means contempt, or contemptuous, or blasphemy. From us. This is what this word means, right? So when I read this, it says that when he blasphemes the name of Yahweh, he shall be put to death. Because we're going to come back to this. I'm going to finish reading this chapter, though. Verse 17 says, Whoever kills any man shall be put to death. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good animal for animal. If a man causes disfigurement with his neighbor or of his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done unto him. Fracture for a fracture, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. As he has caused disfigurement of a man, so it shall be done unto him. And whoever kills an animal shall restore it, but whoever kills a man shall be put to death. You shall have the same law for the stranger and for one who is of your own country. For I am Yahweh, your mighty one. Then Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and they took outside the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. So did the children of Israel did as Moses had commanded. This is the reading of Leviticus chapter 24, verse 1 through verse 23. May Yahweh add enlightenment, clarity, and edification to the reading of his word. Let's turn to the book of John. Yochanan, the 8th chapter, verse 59. And let's see what's also written in another chapter of the book of Yochanan about this blasphemy or the act of the commission of blasphemy. So Yochanan 859 reads this way. That quote, it says, hmm, this is John 8.59. It's a lengthy chapter, so I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It says, and this is verse 56, says this, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Hmm. And the Jews said to him, or the Yehudim said to him, You are not yet 50 years old and have seen Abraham? And Yahushua, Yahshua, Yahushua said unto them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Yahushua hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so pass by. So it is clear when I read this scripture here, if I go back into all of John from the beginning, as I read verse 45 and down, it talks to me, it teaches me about them claiming the man had a demon, and then he was professing that he had had a conversation with Abraham. And later on we read, he says, before Abraham was, I am, which you know that I am is the Hebrew word Ahaya, from the root word Chaya, which means to be. And so what is Yahshua saying here? What is he actually saying here? In the book of John, in the 11th chapter, or rather 10, 1031. 1031. I'll wait for you all to get there. And they've taken up stones to stone him again. So I'm going to read all this unto you again. Verse 22, so you get an understanding. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem. Right in your margin, this is Hanukkah, called Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah, called the Feast of Lights in the books of John later. But this is the Feast of Dedication. And it tells you, and it was winter. And Yahweh walked in the temple in Solomon's ports. 
Then the Yahudim surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Mashiach or the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Yahweh said to them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. And as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Watch now. I and my Father are one. Next verse. Then the Yehudim took up stones to stone him again. And Yahweh shall answer them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Watch what they say. The Yehudim say to him, saying, For a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God, Yah, or El, and Yahshua said unto them, watch now, this, this right here gets me all the time. Is it not written in your law that I said, ye are gods? Wait a minute, that I said, he didn't say that Yah said. He said that I said, you are gods, which is taken from Psalms 82 and 6. Word. Right? That's what it says, right? Talk, talk, on, talk back to me, Zeruiah. This is taken straight from the scripture. And Yahshua, Yahweh is telling you who the one that said it. Because we're getting ready to go somewhere with this. I said, you are gods, written in your law, and if he called them gods, mighty ones, to whom the word of God came. Now, wait a minute. Israelites will tell you in a minute that we are gods. Israelites will quote Psalms 82, 6 and say, ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high, yet you fall like men. But if you want to turn around and call yourself a mighty one, then why not the word of Yah made flesh, which was the mighty one? Because you never saw Yah at any time. You only heard the voice of Yah speaking to you at the midst of the fire, but the only begotten son of Yah is in the midst, in the bosom of the fire. That's who was talking to you the whole time, Israel. That's who was leading you in the wilderness the whole time, Israel. That's who it was. If you read the scriptures and the scriptures teaches you that everything that was made, seen and unseen in Colossians, was made by him. We know when we read the book of Genesis chapter 1, Verse 3 says, in the beginning, verse 1, verse 3 tells you, Yah created what? The heavens and the earth. Verse 3 tells you that he said, let there be light. It was the word that spoke. The word created everything. The word brought forth everything. So when the verse said, I said you are God, it was him telling them in the Psalms, we were God. If you were created in the likeness and the image of the Father in Genesis 1.26, then if I am a lawyer and I'm making a man, a woman, teaching them law after my likeness and my image, what am I making? I'm making a lawyer. If I'm a fireman and I'm teaching them after my likeness and my image how to be a fireman, I'm making a fireman. And if I am a God, a God, a mighty one, teaching man, Adam and Eve, after my likeness and my image, what am I making? I'm making a God. So when I said he spoke the word that before Abraham was, I am. Ahaya. Ahaya is not a name. Ahaya is an expression. Ahaya means to exist. You got Israelites walking around there telling you all that that is a name. That is not a name. And the same Israelites that tell you Ahaya is a name are telling you that Yahweh is not the name. That is the devil. They are liars. Every last one of those brothers that are telling you that are unlearned in Hebrew, and they're liars. That's what I say. I want to debunk that myth that is causing you to have dis disaccord with each other, confusion with each other. Mm -hmm. People are fighting over the name. Mm -hmm. Ahia is not a name. When you say out of Exodus 3, 14, and 15, Ahia, Asher, Ahia, 
That means I am what I will to be. I am that I am. And the word higher is a verb, not a noun, a verb. That means it's got past, present, and future tense. It is not a personal name. But if you read down further, instead of cherry picking for your own wicked and twisted devices, then you will read that it says, this is my name forever. Yahweh is my name. Mm-hmm. Hey. Hey. So when I say blasphemy, when you check Israelites, a blasphemy to create his name. There was an Israelite who had an Egyptian twist to him. His father was an Egyptian. Right there when I read that scripture 30 years ago, I said, oh, something wrong with this. Mm-hmm. Something wrong with this. His daddy was a, was a Hamite. His daddy was a Kemetian. His daddy was from Mitzrayim. Oh, we getting ready to deal with some type of conflict here. And sure enough, he caused dissension in the camp. He cursed. He blasphemed the name of Yah to make it contempt. Now, every sin among man, the scripture says, shall be forgiven. I'm going to throw this question out to anybody in Zeruiah with love and respect to you. Don't you answer this one and let nobody else answer this. What is the unforgivable sin in all of humanity that you cannot do or do and not be forgiven? What is it? Don't nobody know? Huh? A blessed Somebody tell me what is the unforgivable sin? Blaspheming the Ruach. Blaspheming uh, the Ruach. That's right. So all the sins of the sons of men can be forgiven of them. That means every sin you could ever commit. That's not me telling you go commit sin. That's telling you that every sin you had committed, every sin you may commit, will be forgiven of you, except blasphemy the Ruach HaKodesh. So when they said unto him, he is Satan, and he teaches, paraphrasing, and Yeshua said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan be against Satan, his kingdom can't, can't stand. Makes no sense for me being, if I'm the son of the adversary, as you say, then why would I have the right or the power to cast out demons? His kingdom is against itself. And because they knew not the word of y'all, know the power of the spirit behind Mashiach, then they charged him unrighteously with blasphemy. And he told them, every sin that is committed by man, that man could sin, even a sin against the Son of Man, shall be forgiven of them. It's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So when I hear brothers talk about the name is not the name, and that it's satanic, and they get this information from the same, watch this now, the same Khazarian, Euro-Gentile, Jimmy J. Jewish Gentiles that they stand on the next show trying to tear down. That makes no sense. That tells me your scholarship is not biblical. Your scholarship is out of the imagination of your evil and twisted socialistic mind and is not of the mind of the Ruach HaKodesh. And you have caused more confusion in Israel by telling people that an expression, which is a true and divine expression, don't you get me wrong, because it is a divine expression. But it is a higher asher, a higher, and that means I am what I will to be. From the root, I got to say it again so you get it right. From the root, higher, which is a verb, meaning to be. Yah told Moses, tell Israel I exist. To be, I exist. That's what he told him. But my name is from these four letters. Pronouncing the four letters. Yod, hey, wa, hey, pronouncing them with the Hebraic ancient sound of ah behind the Y, ya, behind the H, ha, behind the W, wa, Yahweh. That's the name. That's the purest in ancient form. You can call them whatever you want, beloved. We don't debate that here. To keep the confusion down, we shorten it up and say, yah. 
Four places in the scripture we'll cite it, but we won't beat you over the head and somebody call you a devil because you say the creator's name when they're telling you the pronunciation of the verb expression is the name, not the name. Okay. Not the name at all. And you can tell the arrogance and the negative energy behind what is going on there. And they are the purveyors that use that in some self-centered righteousness as if you have come and arrived. You have not arrived yet. You just got into this yesterday. You need to sit down and learn at the foot of the elders and be taught rightly. Hallelujah. Tell they Y'all all right? Hey. Hey. Hallelujah. Now we go into the law of the land. Into the law of the land. The law of the land is in the 25th chapter. So we're going to read the 25th chapter, depending on how much time we have, because 26 and 27 are lengthy, and there's a lot of stuff in 26. And so let's read on. 25, to the yard. Hallelujah. Let's look at it. see. You all all right, saints? I can't hear you all. And you all absolutely quiet tonight. You all all right? Hey. <laughs> hey. Enjoy myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, just making sure. Let's go into 25. 25 deals with what is called the law of the land. The law of the land, and we will go in excerpts. We'll deal with the Shabbatical year. Then we'll go into the law of the land of the Yobel, which is the Jubilee. And then we would then move into the land and the redemption of the land as an inheritance. So there's three sections here that we're going to deal here in Leviticus 25. And then we will close it out reiterating the kinsman redeemer that we read months ago, which is in the same chapter. And we'll close it out in verse 54 of 25. So it reads on this wise. And it says, And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto Benai Yisrael, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep the Shabbats unto Yahweh. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Shabbat of solemn rest for the land. A Shabbat unto Yahweh, you shall neither sow in your field nor prune your vineyards. Now stop. Genesis 1, 1 through 31 gives us the six days of creation. Genesis 2, 1 through 4 gives us the seventh day. Seven is the number of perfection. It is the number of rest, right? It is the number of an ending cycle. Seven is the Hebraic seventh character, which is Zion. And Zion... Zion means righteousness, right? Seven is the number of perfection in a complete cycle. So now you get to the seven days. You count seven months. Takes us to a cycle. Now you're being taught to count seven years. So you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh year, the land rests. It says, what grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap nor gather the fruit of your unattended vine, for it is a year of rest in your land. All right? It is a year of rest. The Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you. All right? The Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you. For you, your male, the female servant, your hired man, the stranger who dwells within you. For your livestock, your beasts that are in your land and all its produce shall be for food. So everything that comes out the land is food for everybody. All the people, all the Israelite people, and all of that which you own, that's your livestock. Right? So this is this year is a vegan year. Right? I'm gonna take you back every time I'm gonna take you back to Genesis 129. The original diet, the Genesis diet, is a plant based, herbalistic vegan diet. I know where you are at now is where I once was at one time. But we got to get back to the Genesis in the beginning. All right? Verse 8 deals with what is called 
the law of the Yobel, or HaTorah Le Yobel, the law of the Jubilee, the 50th year. Reading, verse 8, you shall count seven Shabbats of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Shabbats of years shall be for you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee or Yobel to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants it shall be a jubilee for you each of you each of you each of you shall return to his own possession and each of you shall return to his own family. The 50th year shall be a yobel to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your unattended vine. For it is a jubilee. It shall be kodesh, holy unto you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of the yobel, each of you shall return to his own possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, his hand, from his hand, you shall not oppress another, one another. According to the number of the years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of the years of the crops, he shall sell it to you. According to the multitude of the years, you shall increase its price. According to the fewer number of the years, you shall diminish its price. For he shall sell it to you according to the number of years of your crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear Yahweh, for I am Yahweh, your mighty one. You shall observe my statutes, keep my judgments, and perform them, and you will then dwell in your land safely. Then the land will yield fruit, and you will eat the fruit of your land and dwell there safely. See, the land needs rest too, right? So you can't keep turning the earth over, turning the earth over on the land. You begin to de defile her and strip her of all of her mineral, natural resources. So we, when we kept these scriptures, when we kept this law, we allowed the land to rest so it could what? Rejuvenate the life-giving substance and nutrients that were in her. The sun would continuously pour down its rays upon her, and the rich black soil that is in the southern part and middle part of Israel would nurture, be nurtured by her by the water from the heavens. But if you keep stripping her, you keep, then you unturn the earth, and then you don't have anything in it that will, it will produce a yield to you good food. So if you say, because some of us will say, this is the next verse, verse 20, if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather our produce? The Creator is talking here. Then I will command my blessings upon you in the sixth year and will bring forth produce enough for three years. You need to write that down. Remember, he would give us manna every day, every day, every day. And on the sixth day, how much manna did we get? A double portion. So he gave us a double blessing. So we didn't have to go out on the seventh day and do no work on the Shabbat. That's Exodus chapter 16. So here he's telling you in the year coming to the Shabbatical year, it says, what shall we eat in the seventh year? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year. And it will bring forth for you enough food for three years. You shall sow in the eighth year, eat the old produce until the ninth year, until its produce come in, and you shall eat of the old harvest. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. That means that when you own land, when we own property in Israel, because land is real estate, then in the 50th year, whatever you loaned to somebody else that was yours or they were in debt to you, you had to set them free, beloved. You could not keep the perpetuity of debt circulating in Israel. Every seven years was a Shemitah, you set the people free. Every 50th year, seven times 749 plus one, you set the people free. 
But when you're in the land of the captivity, if you understand what captivity means, it means you're captive. If you understand that captive is related to bondage and bondage is related to debt, and you're dealing with a security note that is a debt called a dollar bill, and when you circulate debt, which is a note, you are perpetuating debtism and inflationism. You will never come up out of debt here. Ever. Till you leave from here. The system is designed to perpetrate debt. To perpetuate debt. Before Obama got in office, <laughs> Mr. Bush was $10 trillion in the red. Mr. Bush got this economy from Mr. Clinton who is $5 trillion in the black. If I use simple mathematics and do subtraction, George W. Bush put this country $15 trillion in debt in eight years. He was a rich, oil-bearing, wealthy white boy that we call Euro-Gentile. Somebody ought to be listening to what I'm saying because this goes next to the other person they're getting ready to try to put in that office who is another rich, wealthy Euro-Gentile. And you think if Bush put this country $15 trillion in debt, then how much worse will Donald Trump, who's been bankrupt himself four times? Do you understand what is happening here? They're creating more debt. Pharaoh wanted to keep you in bondage. They don't want you to come up out of here. They want you to keep buying and buying and consuming and consuming and consuming. That's debt. We are telling you that the scripture tells you to come up out of here. Not continue to invest in here. But to make your investment in yourself someplace else. Other than here. In the 50th year, you're supposed to come out. 1619 began your captivity here in America. According to the scriptures that is written in Genesis 15, 13, nor of a surety Abram, your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve the stranger 400 years. There are eight jubilees in that 400 years. 50 times. Eight is 400. The Hebrew word for end is the letter ta, which is a sign called an oak. The numerical value of ta is 400. The scripture says 400 years, I will come and judge that nation. 1619 to 2019 is 400 years. Wisdom tells me that we should be preparing to get up out of here. Not at the 400th year, but before the 400th year. If you understand Bible prophecy. Daniel said to you when we read the books of Daniel, Daniel said, I understood by the books of Jeremiah the prophet, that the captivity in Babylon was 70 years. When the 70 years was up, Daniel and the brethren came up out of captivity in Babylon, and they returned to the land of Israel. When the 400 years are up, you shall return to the land of Israel. There's no need for you to be here anymore. Besides, the heat that's getting ready to be put on you will be an indication to you to get up out of here. And if you've been watching the news, if you've been reading the paper, if you know anybody that's a relative, that the persecution has increased, it is an indication that you need to get ready to get out of here. The year of release is upon you. You are in the 150th Jubilee. And when 2019 comes, the trumpet shall be sounded, and your 400 years of captivity in America is up. Do not be waiting here to be getting up out of here at the last minute. Because there will be peril sometimes, as the book said. You read the scriptures that Peter and Peter tells you that peril sometimes shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves and haters of Yah. Look outside and examine what is going on. They shall be proud and boastful. They shall deny the power therein. The scripture says in the last day that men will love themselves and be lovers of themselves. Lovers of men. Paul says, burning, burning in their flesh. Like they burn for women. You don't need to look and examine what's happening around you. Please, beloved. Your soul is hanging in the balance. Your soul of your children, the soul of your wife, the soul of your husband, your grandmother, grand people you love, hanging in the balance. 
America is on the edge of judgment. You can see the handwriting on the wall. I'm not trying to scare you. I am warning you as a watchman. I don't want no blood of yours on my hand. That's why the warning is going out. You are in a phase to be prepared to receive that land. That land cannot receive us in our gentilic mindset and behavior that we acquired here in the lands of the hells and captivities of North America, in the Caribbean, down in Brazil, over in Haiti, next door in Belize, wherever we scatter, whether we in France, whether we in Germany, where we in Nigeria, Ghana, in South Africa, Israel is scattered all over the world. We have picked up the traits and the habits of these heathens. We've been dirtied among the nations where we are, soiled and stained. We're blemished. We need a Righteous, spiritual cleaning amongst our people. Okay. All right? It is not to point the finger of judgment. It's to bring to us the hand of righteous correction and turn our attention towards the Holy One of Israel. Mm. As the book continues on and saying, in the 50th year, and I'm reading from verse 13 now, it says, you shall return everyone to his own possession. If you sell anything to your neighbor or buy something from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number, yes, I'm reading it again. According to the number of the jubilees, you shall buy from your neighbor. According to the number of years of your crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years that you increase its price, and according to the fewer number of years you shall diminish its price, he sells it to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear Yahweh, your mighty one, for I am Yahweh. You shall observe my statutes, keep my judgments, perform them, and in the land you shall dwell safely. Just read that. Now, if you keep this into its composite form, where it tells you back down in 23, the land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. That's Yah's land. It's land that he promised to you. How can somebody else promise something to you that don't belong to them? Do you understand this, what I'm saying, beloved? And the Philistines talking about that's their land, Palestinian. That's not your land. You are mixed, a robber of Indo-Europeans and the remnants of Philistines left over. That's not your land. You're not even Canaanites. That's from understanding the book of Genesis chapter 10 and the books of Chronicles and the genealogy. Everybody in the late claim to your land. People that came up out of the coal barons of Europe trying to lay claim on your land and they the sons and daughters of Kazar, the sons and daughters of Theodore Herzl, the sons and daughters of Bull and the King. That's not their land. That land don't belong to them. It don't belong to any Philistines. It don't belong to the Moabites or the Ammonites. That land belongs to you. Why? Your father, who lands it belongs to, promised it to you. That's your land. That's the whole difference of what we as we teach. It is your land. You are about to inherit that land. The scriptures continues where it says, if one of your brethren becomes poor, this is verse 25, and has sold some of his possessions, and has a redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or if a man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count for the years since the sale and restore unto him the remainder to the man who sold it, that he may return to his possession. But he is not able to have it restored to for himself. Then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of the Jubilee. So he's not able to redeem it. It has to remain into the person whose hand the possession is in. But in the 50th year, huh? In the 50th year, the Yobel, the Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his own possession. If a man sells his house in the walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year, he may redeem it. Urban city. So any of the cities in Israel that have urban areas that are walled, you got a year to redeem it. But if it's not redeemed within the space of a full year, then a house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it throughout his generations. It shall not be released in the Jubilee. However, the houses of the village, unwalled villages, you'll find that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So the houses of the villages, which have no walls around them, shall be counted as fields or lands of the field or fields of the country. 
they may be redeemed, but they shall be released in the Jubilee. Nevertheless, the city of the Levites and houses in the cities of the possessions of the Levites may be redeemed at any time. If a man purchases a house from a Levite, then the house that was sold in the city of the possession shall be released in the Jubilee. For the house in the city of the Levites are the possessions of the children of Israel. But the field of the common lands of their cities may not be sold, for it is the perpetual, it is their perpetual possession. Verse 35. <clears throat> If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him. Hmm. We need to start doing that. You shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him. That means you don't charge each other. We don't charge each other interest or usury. But fear Yahweh that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money as a usury nor lend him your food as a prophet. I am Yahweh, your mighty one, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your mighty one. And if one of your brethren dwells by you, becomes poor, and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve like a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you unto the year of the Yobel. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to his own possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. You shall not sell them as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor. You shall fear Yahweh, your mighty one. And as for your male and female slaves, who you may have from the other nations, see, you shall never make an Israelite a slave. Amongst Israelites, you have servants, but you have to treat them like a hireling. You have to compensate him. And in the year of the Yobel and the Shemitah, you let him go or her go. But now it deals with how we were to treat those of the other nations who came into servitude. For us, I can guarantee you, you didn't strip them of their names, their language, their culture. You didn't strip them of their, their culture became your, you didn't strip them from it. Hang on. You didn't maliciously mistreat their women and their children. That was not in your that is not even in your spirit. That is not in the people of the book. Mm -hmm. That's not you. You are the most kind and forgiving and loving people on the entire planet. You love those who hate you. Man, if you don't fulfill this book, man, if you don't do what Yahshua Hamashiach said you would do, unwittingly you fulfilling the book. You ain't got the power to see this, but you fulfilling the book. You love those who hate you. But a prophet among you is not honored even in his own country. Look at the similarities here. If you ain't the Messiah being crucified for the world as the example of my Yahshua HaMashiach hung on a tree just like him, then there was no Messiah. That's what I'm telling you. And he was the Messiah. And you are in the spitting image of your father. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hmm. Hallelujah. Right. Hold on, y'all. This is, this is food for thought, beloved. Food for thought. As for you, males and female slaves, you may have from the nations that are around you. From them, you may buy female and male slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the stranger who dwells among you and the families who are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall become your property. You may take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Now, if a sojourner or a stranger, watch now, close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or the sojourner close to you or to the member of the stranger's family. After he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his own brethren may redeem him. For his uncle, his uncle's son may redeem him. Anyone who is next of kin, 
Gael. That is the Hebrew expression that is there. Gael, which means the kinsman redeemer. One who is next to him. That means that if we understood this, the only ones that could redeem us would be one that looked like us. One like us. You look at that picture, that stick, that image, that idol on the wall hanging, don't look nothing like you. Caesar Borges don't look nothing like Yahshua. Nothing like Yahweh Shai. He looked like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, who was his relative that he posed for in the picture. Somebody coming to redeem you would look like you. Wouldn't look like the enemy amongst you. And here you go sleeping with the enemy again. Worshipping the enemy again. Calling upon the name of false gods. And when you call upon the name of the false god, J-E-S-U-S, -S, it conjures up the image of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Euro Gentile. Does not give you any type of similar to, to the Hebrew Messiah. Don't look nothing like you. You are supposed to be looking for the Kenzin Redeemer. One of your own. And not somebody else other than you. Paul told you to beware the gospel of another Yahshua coming. He told you to look for a deceptive Jesus coming. He was told this was going to happen. Mm. And this has occurred. The Hebrew Messiah, according to Revelation, had hair like lamb's wool, feet like brass burnt in the oven. But the deceptive Jesus has straight hair. He has pale skin. That is a deception. Mm. You're mm. supposed to be looking for the kinsman redeemer. And the kinsman redeemer would come to you in the year of the Jubilee. When Yahshua was coming and he walked into Jerusalem and got on the donkey or the ass to fall of the colt, rather. And they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That was that Passover. That was during the Jubilee. You came out of Egypt during the Jubilee. Mm. Understand the patterns of these scriptures. This is why I'm such a stickler for the high holy day. There are patterns here. Appointed times and feasts. You're looking for the kinsman redeemer. If he is not able, someone of his own family must redeem him. Or if he is able, he may redeem himself. Verse 50. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the years he was sold unto the year of the jubilee. And it shall be according to the time that he was a hired servant for him. If there's still many years remaining, and according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money which he was bought with. And if there remain but a few years until the Jubilee, all right, few years to the Jubilee, if there remain a few years, hallelujah, to the Yobel. Let me pause here for a minute. If there remain a few years into the Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him according to the years he shall pay the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the Yobel, he and his children with him. Why? For the children of Israel are my servants. They belong to me whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh. That is the reading of Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1 through 54. May Yahweh add enlightenment, clarity, and edification to the reading of his word. Hallelujah. 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 All right. So there are two more chapters, and it's at the 10 o'clock hour. And we are going to table them for this time because they are lengthy chapters. And they are really lengthy chapters. And there's a lot of information in it, and I don't want you to miss it. But I can assure you we will pick it up next week and go into the books of Leviticus, close it out, and then go into the books of Numbers. And so is there any questions on what we read about the Yobel and the law of the land? Right? There is none, huh? Surprise. So yeah. That means when you all see the the, the quiz and the, <laughs> the test and the exam at the end of the following week, you all going to be all right with it because it's pretty lengthy, as I mentioned to you, but you've got all the time to take to complete it 
You go to quizstar.com and you search under Hebrew Biblical Fundamentals for the test and take it at your own time. You can take it as many times, I think, up to four times as you like. So let's turn our attention to Jerusalem because we will be reassembling on the Shabbat Yom at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. And so let us bow our heads and humble our spirits as we pray before the Most High. Abba Yahweh, giving thanks unto thee for this evening. Thank you for the assembly and for those who have come to share and fellowship with us. Abba, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your loving kindness. For blessed art you forever and ever, O King of the universe, and blessed be Yahweh Shah HaMashiach, who is Messiah unto the glory of you, Yah the Father. Abba, I ask you that you would pour out your spirit upon the brothers and sisters in Israel, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, and that they would have a heart to perceive and that you would bring your people, even the sheep of your pasture, into the bond of your covenant. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, Yah. For you are our strength and our redeemer, HaKadosh Israel. Let all of Israel who worship, love, and praise Yahweh say hallelujah. 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 Yah. Yah 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 Hallelujah. Lila Tov, brothers and sisters, shalom, shalom.
I want it. 